So this talk will be very related to the talk Neil gave. In some sense, it's about searching for like formal foundations for the kind of work Neil likely described. This talk is going to be very similar to one I gave at Simon's. So hopefully there's not too much overlap in people having seen it. I think our thinking has evolved, but these slides haven't over the last couple of months. Before we jump in, I just want to give a quick warning. I think this talk is mostly going to be about raising questions um, and trying to describe the questions we work on and why we're interested in those questions and won't really, we'll have zero theorems and won't present the results of any experiments. So I can talk about the work we've been doing on this front, but I'm going to mostly be focused here on presenting the questions, explaining why we care about them. So I apologize to those who are hoping for theorem statements. So the high level motivation for sort of all of this work, as well as more empirical work and interpretability, is that when we deal with neural networks traditionally, we kind of train and test them as black boxes. So if we want to estimate quality or safety, we just choose some distribution of inputs, we run the model, we see if it seems safe on that distribution of inputs. This leaves us with a couple of big problems, right? So one is that it's very hard to predict or even detect when a model will fail. Um, a second is that you have some empirical measurement and a model, if you optimize a model to do well according to your measurements, it may learn to exploit flaws in your measurement. So a, a hope we have is that if you could take a given model and then explain why it works on some distribution, you could help address those challenges. But you could say, here's why the model works on this distribution. Now we can detect when that argument breaks down, when sort of a necessary assumption was violated, when something unusual was happening. Um, or it may help us predict, here were the key assumptions, and so here's when things might go wrong. So at a very high level, this may be the motivation for a lot of work in interpretability, and it's going to be the motivation for the kind of formal framework we're looking for here. To be able to say things about neural networks that would be difficult to say from the input-output behavior alone, but that we hope will be easier if we can explain the explain why a model works. So I'm going to have talk in four sections. I'm going to start by talking about what we might mean by this word explanation. Um, then I'm going to talk about heuristic arguments, sort of our hypothesis or the, the operationalization we're exploring, talk about the formal problem of actually looking for a heuristic estimator, and then talk about um, it's like no coincidence principle, kind of a universality property for a, a system of heuristic arguments. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a sort of toy setting where we can talk really cleanly about explanation. Um, so I'm going to imagine that we have some, I want to train a neural network F sub theta to approximate some known target function G on a known distribution D. So you could imagine, for example, I sample random three set instances I have some target function, which is, was this satisfiable or not? Um, maybe I have a really expensive way for solving instances from this distribution, right? With enough time, I can get a pretty good answer for random instances. And I want to train a neural network to implement that same function, but faster. So a lot of the settings we care about don't have this form, right? This is a very nice algorithmic task where you can say, here's exactly what we want the model to do. All we're talking about is computational speed. Often in the real world, we care about engaging with sort of some unknown data generating process or some distribution where we don't know how the distribution works. But I think this is a nice case because machine learning is still doing something non-trivial here. And it's really easy to talk about what we mean by explanation. So in this setting, we can say, given a particular set of parameters theta, so let's have a big transformer. My transformer has, you know, 100 billion parameters. I could ask, why do those 100 billion parameters cause the model to actually do this task? Like a priori, it's very surprising if you give me 100 billion parameters for that model to do a good job of solving SAT. Right? Even setting aside the hardness of SAT is just a very specific function. Like why is it that this particular set of parameters gives rise to this particular function? And so I could seek an explanation of that phenomenon. I could try and explain why this particular neural network implements this particular function. Um, maybe are there any questions about the setting before jumping in? Like what is, again, the purpose of this is to say, here's a setting where Machine learning can do something interesting, and it's meaningful to ask, like, can we explain why a model works? And we could ask the same questions more generally, but we'd bring in a little bit more philosophical baggage once we start talking about, like, explaining why something in the world is the way it is. I think that being in this setting where we have the target function defined just makes things very clean. And basically, the whole rest of the talk will take place in this setting. Not for this particular function, G. We'll talk about, like, different functions, G. It doesn't really matter that much, but where we have a, a concrete fact we want to explain about a model. So now I'm going to talk about various possible operationalizations of explanation. So one option is just an explanation is whatever helps a human understand why the model works. Like anything you can write down in a big paper and show to a human, and then a human will be like, oh, yeah, I do feel like you've explained it to me, or I do feel like now I see why this set of 100 billion parameters leads to this behavior. 
So I think this is a very natural option. It's kind of like maybe the default, like the pre-theoretic default is like, we don't have some formal notion of explanation, but a human will know it when they see it. You can do some experiments. They can just assess whether they feel like it's been explained. So maybe uh, giving a, a super high level overview of like stylized mechanistic interpretability. Right, here's a kind of activity you can engage in, evaluate it according to this like pre-theoretic understanding. So I can take a model that implements some function. I can try and assign meanings to neurons or directions in activation space for that model. I can look at how those neurons or directions are related to one another by the weights of the model. I can try and tell a story that makes sense. So, right, so here's a diagram from a paper trying to analyze a model that classifies image net images. And you're telling some story, right? You're like, well, there's window detector over here and there's a car body detector over here. And those are combined by these weights in a very intuitive way to give you a car detector. And if I'm a human looking at this, I kind of feel like now I understand why it is that this neuron on the right hand of the slide is detecting cars. At least if I already believe that the neurons on the left hand side were detecting windows and wheels and car bodies. And you imagine that I like, worked my way inductively through the model telling this kind of story. I don't think anyone's really done this in that compelling a way, but you can at least imagine this hope of putting together the whole story and saying, now I understand why it is that this thing classifies cars correctly. Um, and here we, we're not in a setting where we have a formal definition of what a car is. You can imagine doing right, the same exercise in the context of an algorithmic task. I'm not sure what Neil talked about when he was here, but I think Neil has done this exercise in a few examples. This is a picture from a paper, one of Neil's papers. So here we have a really well-defined task of modular addition. We have some transformer which performs that task. Um, and you could again ask, why is it that a transformer with those weights performs that task? And you could do exactly the same kind of exercise we discussed for the image model, though now it's scaled down a bit to a much simpler system, where you again tell some story about what different parts of the model represent. You say, well, okay, these directions represent some embedding in the Fourier basis, the representation in the Fourier basis of the numbers mod n. And then you can look at how the weights work and you can that the, the operations the weights perform make sense in terms of the meanings of the inputs and outputs. Right? So you can spin this entire kind of story and then do a bunch of experiments to see that it makes sense. So when I when I think about what an explanation is, this is kind of my my informal prototype is this kind of look at a neural network, try and make sense of what's going on with it, try and do some experiments or say something that like makes it make sense to us. Um, so there's a couple, I, I really like this activity. Like I'm very excited about work that just gets in there with neural nets and tries to make more sense of them. I think certainly from a theorist perspective, there's two big problems. And I think these do correspond to not just theoretical problems, but very practical problems. So one is we don't really know what we mean when we say understand, right? Again, the definition was just whatever you show to a human that makes them feel like they understand. And I think that's like a little bit tough, both as a principle to organize sort of an academic inquiry around. It's hard to say like, what are the rules of the game here? Like, how do you tell if someone did a good job? It also makes it very hard to talk about like, is this possible, right? Is this, how can we automate this process if it's ultimately just about what makes sense to a human? And so related to a second question, which is just, is it the case that humans can understand in the sense that we want to understand either big models or models that think with alien concepts, right? So in the context of big models, you this, this story relies on breaking them down into pieces that make sense to humans, but it's unclear if models can be decomposed along like interfaces that do make sense to humans. It's unclear as you have models that understand things humans don't, if there will be parts of this process where humans don't, just don't get it. So that's an option, which I like a lot. I think it would be valuable to be able to answer these kinds of questions though, and say what we actually mean by understand and start to be able to analyze like, hey, is this kind of notion scalable? Is this something that's going to exist? So a very superficially different option is just proving that a model works. So again, in the case of exactly this, modular addition interpretability, you could say like, hey, can I actually prove a theorem that for this given set of 100 million weights, if I sample A and B at random, then I like run them through the model and I compare that to the modular addition, then with very high probability, they agree. Right? In fact, in this case, it's a very easy theorem to prove because there's only so many inputs A and B, but if you imagine, um, right, as you increase the number of possible inputs, the complexity of the naive proof will grow exponentially. Um, even here, the naive proof is like quadratic, but you might hope for a much shorter proof. And so you might hope to be able to do is give some proof which scales in a better way, which like mirrors the structure of this interpretability argument. So we previously had all of these like intuitive to humans explanations or stories about what's happening with parts of this model. You could imagine putting those into a proof, right? This thing I put on the bottom is actually like kind of close structurally to a proof. Um, it turns out not to work as a proof. If you try and turn it into a proof, you can't carry the proof through. Like if you look at the errors, you don't really have control over the errors in the right way. There were a lot of steps of this that are very hard to formalize. Um, this is an activity some people are engaged in right now. Like one activity ARC is funding is just actually carrying out these proofs for small models to understand like exactly how large is this gap, which is a kind of interesting project. Um, but to say right now is if you try and prove things, that's just even 
right? This, this mechanistic interpretability is often applied to very simple circuits and simple models. If you try and prove things, you have to amp down even further um, and things get even rougher to try and run these proofs. But maybe my point, the key point here, granting that it's difficult is that there is some sense in which this proof carries the same kind of understanding as this informal story that a human was giving. Right? So even if a human doesn't necessarily understand this proof, it did have to like tell a story about what was happening. It gave some like mechanistic account of why it is that these activations combined in this way give rise to this result. Oh, and oh from can the... I just ask quickly? Um, oh yeah. I, I'm, I don't see why it's not a proof. Like if I, you know, m multiply to matrices with cosines and sines, then I can read off the product. Yeah, so if you imagine this model that's written down here, in some sense that is a proof of a certain like really purified neural net. And if you like train your neural net for like a really, really long time, eventually your neural net will get so close to that idealized thing that you can say, well, I have my proof for the ideal thing and then I can just down the errors. This model is faithfully implementing that ideal thing. But if you look at like a neural net trained in like any normal way, it's not actually close enough to the ideal thing that you can carry out that proof. So I guess it's an a priori not obvious, but it's something you'll discover as you try and run the proofs. You're like, actually the error bounds that I get out of my proof are much looser than the thing that's actually true of this model. Um, and in some sense, this is like the, the observation that motivates this like quest for formalization that we're, we're in here. Um, yeah, I think this thing is, is very close to a proof and you actually can produce the neural net, which you can prove it. I think the basic proof question in general is, is there actually a short proof and can you find it? So I think that in very simple cases, we can give proofs and you can give proofs when you can do this exhaustive enumeration. But in theory, there's actually just not much reason to expect that a complicated neural network would have a proof. And in fact, I think there's like pretty good theoretical arguments that it won't be the case in general. There's just a lot of true things that aren't provable. And actually like, these aren't like weird Gödelian cases, just in some sense, if you take a generic complicated computation with some property, you can't prove it has that property. You like don't really have any license to expect there to be a proof. So option one, I didn't like, in some sense, because it's informal, I can't say what the rules of the game are. Option two, we can at least say the rules of the game, and I think it would be great if it worked. And the basic problem is just, I think it is really hard to prove things about complicated computations, both in theory and in practice. In theory, there's not much reason to expect it to work. And in practice, like, I'm excited about it. I'm interested in like seeing if it can even catch up with mechanistic interpretability, but it has been incredibly hard so far. Cool. So any questions about this? So now we have like set up like this basic tension or like this basic problem. This talk is going to be about sort of a third option. You may want to stop here and ask if there's any questions about this setup. So the option we're going to explore is a heuristic argument that a model works. So to say like we want to give something which is a formal argument in the same sense that a proof is like a formal deductive argument where there's rules of the game about what steps follow from what other steps and how you use them to arrive at conclusions, but which unlike a proof doesn't give perfect confidence, which instead says like here's my best guess about this quantity. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about what I mean by that. I'm gonna try and give like an explanation of why you might think these things would exist, what they look like and so on. So a very simple example, I think most people are probably familiar with is the heuristic argument for the twin prime conjecture. So I could ask the following question, if I sample a random number X, what is the probability that X and X plus two will both be prime? So if I sample from a very large range, this quantity is extremely hard to compute exactly, or I think we just don't know what it is for very large n. But we can make a reasonable effort. We can make a reasonable best guess by saying, okay, we know the probability that the x is prime, right, by the prime number theorem, that's just one over log n. We know the probability that x plus two is prime. We have no idea what the correlation between these events are. We don't know whether they're positively correlated or negatively correlated or what. We're just gonna make the default guess that those events are uncorrelated and guess that the probability of the conjunction is the product of the probability, one over log squared n. Right, so this is extremely unlike a proof. One way it's unlike a proof is that it's subject to revision or I'll say defeasible. Um, so an example of a revision is like, if X is prime, then X is odd. And so X plus two is odd. And so actually the probability X plus two is prime given that X is prime is more like two over log N than one over log N because the probability of an odd number is prime is about two over log N. So two over log squared N would be a better estimate for this bottom line probability. And there's nothing to say like that's the end of the line, right? There could be more and more correction terms in fact, if you take like all the correction terms people know about, you get some estimate that's like, I don't know, 1.66 over log n or something like that. One point, anyway, I don't know exactly what the number is, which is in very good agreement with the empirics, but it's still, we don't know if that's the final. We're just like, those are the considerations we've noticed so far. We make arguments like this and they get us something which empirically seems kind of right, but it's possible that there's a higher or like, yeah, that there's some term which becomes dominant in the limit, which we just haven't seen yet. And this doesn't rule that out, even though it gives you some like prima facie reason to guess that this would be the right answer.
And I think this kind of diffusible probabilistic reasoning is quite common. Um, so maybe it's cleanest and, and most widely known in number theory. So like if you want to ask some random question about like the additive structure of primes, well, you can often get a very good estimate is just saying like, well, I don't know what this correlation is, but I'm going to pretend that things were independent and random. Or if you want to ask, does the CF Fantine equation have solutions? You can get good estimates in just like a really wide range of cases by saying like, I'm going to pretend that this set of solutions was distributed randomly, or they're like these two events, properties of a number independent from one another. So I'll see this quite frequently in like physics. Right? Physicists often don't prove things, probably it's because they don't like formal proofs, but sometimes it's because they actually want to make these arguments that say, there's some correction terms, but we expect them to be lower order, or we expect these things to be approximately independent, and we're going to do some perturbative analysis around independence. And again, these arguments, I think, are quite close to formal arguments. Like, they aren't just like a human saying some intuitions that seem right, but they're definitely not proofs, right? They're not exact calculations. They make this kind of presumption of, like, I'm going to drop these terms. Um, similarly, if I talk about dynamical systems and I want to understand the behavior of a dynamical system, I can often get, like, a reasonable handle on that system by just saying, like, well, is X going to happen? Is Y going to happen? Let's pretend those events are independent. And the thing I want to emphasize about all of these estimates is that they're very much not Monte Carlo estimates. So when I say, like, I dropped these terms or I assume these things are uncorrelated. I'm not just sampling random pairs x and x plus two and seeing how often they're prime. I'm making some structural argument of the form like, well, I actually have a proof that prime numbers have density one over log n. I have like a good explanation for why they have density one over log n. Um, I've actually, yeah, anyway. And now I'm just making this guess where like I, I don't know anything about the relationship, so I'm zeroing out the correlation, which is quite different from having sampled sometimes and measured that correlation. In some sense, it's just worse than a Monte Carlo estimate and that it's less reliable. Um, Monte Carlo estimates are actually correct, and these estimates can often be wrong. But in some sense, it's better than a Monte Carlo estimate, and it does tell me something about the mechanism or like why this thing was true. So I think if you look at the structure of these estimates, I think across all of these domains, they are mostly deductively valid arguments, but they just commonly make this move of treating some unknown quantity as random and then estimating expectations or correlations with some heuristic. In particular, like there's sort of two big salient heuristics. So these arguments, I think the, the first post I've seen really laying out these rules was this Terence Tau blog post from 2012. And he calls this the basic heuristic, which is just if you don't know how two things are correlated, then assume the expectation of the product is the product of the expectations. You can also make a slightly more nuanced estimate if you know something about the relationship between A and B. So perhaps you know about some factors V, like is X odd? And you think that mediates a rela relationship between X being prime and X plus two being prime. Then rather than simply assuming the covariance is zero, you can assume that the covariance, that sort of they're conditionally independent given Z. So you sort of project both of them onto Z and say, well, we'll calculate the relationship between those and then assume that the residuals are uncorrelated. And that gives you this formula where the covariance between A and B is just given by the product of the AZ covariance, the ZB covariance divided by the Z variance. And you can extend this to conditioning on multiple facts. And I think just like a common theme is that this estimate or this heuristic is like a very, as a very strong heuristic, or like uh, it works a lot of the time, it gives you like a reasonable first pass answers to questions, and it's quite flexible and applies across a lot of domains. So this is roughly when I talk about heuristic arguments, I think this is sort of the central heuristic that we end up we end up using, or that we're interested in formalizing and understanding. So our work is kind of motivated by a conjecture that we have all these heuristic arguments across a bunch of different domains, and these are instances of some unknown simple and general formalism, rather than being like domain specific tricks that work well in practice. Like by analogy, if you imagine logical deduction, this is like a very nice general framework, which you can instantiate in a bunch of domains, but doesn't involve a whole bunch of domain specific tricks. It may involve domain specific axioms, but the basic rules of the game are common rules of the game. Um, and just to be clear, like the contrast here is like you could have imagined instead this is a fact about the prime numbers where the prime numbers behave like they're random and like a fact about physical systems or physical systems behave as if things are independent and a fact about like, you know, Diophantine equations or dynamical systems to find simple dynamical systems or whatever. Um, and the claim is actually this is just there's something general that's kind of true by default. Yeah, I think that the reason this seems plausible is that. One, looking across these domains, there is this kind of simple general structure, like the arguments feel valid with this like kind of not that diverse set of heuristics that capture like really a lot of what people do. And the second is that I think these arguments do seem to produce empirically good estimates by default. Like if we consider the in prime conjecture, the estimate you get is quite bad, right? You get this estimate one over log squared, which is off by like 30% or something from the truth. 
but you can actually figure out why. It's not just randomly off by 30%. Whenever there's this empirical mismatch where an argument is off, there was like a better argument of the same type that helps you get closer and closer to the truth. It's actually very hard to track down cases where not only do these arguments lead you astray, but you can't then get closer to the correct argument by adding more considerations, which leads to this conjecture we'll talk about later that like actually there is always such a correction term in every case, which is a kind of wild conjecture. Um, so now sort of putting all together and talking about the object we're actually going to be looking for in the end, and then I'll maybe step back again for questions. So we are searching for some kind of simple program analogous to a proof verifier, which takes as input a formally defined quantity X that we want to estimate. Um, so for example, X is like, how often does this neural network successfully predict A plus B mod N? Or how often does this neural network successfully solve SAT or whatever? Um, so X is some formally defined quantity where we can write down the definition precisely. You have a series of arguments or observations that are relevant to that quantity. Um, so these are things like these informal heuristic arguments are pointing out particular features that mediate correlations. And then this thing, the simple program, spits out an estimate in light of all those arguments. So where a proof verifier would either spit out like, I'm certain or I have no idea, this thing is just always going to spit out some like subjective expectation. So for a proposition, it will just give you a probability that the proposition is true. And our goal, so in the case of understanding a neural network, would be to say, let's let's take the quantity x in our choice setting where f sub theta is a distillation or like a, a neural network chain to predict g. This quantity x is the accuracy, the, the probability with which f sub theta and g agree. And our goal is to find some arguments such that they explain that agreement in the sense that they cause this very simple program g to get a correct estimate, ideally a correct estimate, which is then robust to the addition of additional considerations and if we have that in hand, then I think it's unclear if we've done what the people who do interpretability initially wanted. Like, it's unclear if we could say that we understand the model. I think we've done something that's very analogous to proving that a model has a property. We have at least, like, found some mechanistic account, some, like, structure within the model that we've identified and pointed out. But at least from the perspective of this program, G explains why it is that the model has this property. Right? It leads G to sort of trace through those mechanisms that are pointed out and say, like, oh, yeah, based on everything you've said, I see why this thing is doing modular addition. And again, it's not necessarily the case that a human is seeing that. Like in the end, you might be looking at some giant arguments. In fact, we expect these arguments are going to be hundreds of billions of parameters for a real neural net. It's looking at some giant mess of numbers, and at least to G, this all makes sense. I think for the purpose of this talk, maybe I will mostly talk about like what would make G a good estimator, like what do you want out of G? And I will just leave it up to faith that there is sort of another line of work of if you're able to make estimates of this form, how does that actually address these kind of motivating problems at the beginning? How does it allow us to detect when a model might break down or predict how robust this behavior is. Yeah. So the general hope is that we would love to prove neural net things about neural networks. I am concerned that proof is intractable. Like both in theory and practice, it seems really hard. There are lots of domains where you can't prove things, right? This is kind of the default human condition. It seems like the feasible probabilistic reasoning is just quite common and successful in lots of those domains. Um, I think that reasoning is very similar to the kind of defeasible probabilistic reasoning people do when they look informally at neural networks. Um, but I am concerned, or like as a theorist, I don't really love trying to scale informal reasoning to neural networks, right? I think it is quite hard. You're scaling quite far. So I think explanations of interesting neural networks behaviors will literally be billions of pages if you write them out. And so this is not a kind of thing where like it's actually going to be humans pouring over it. It's possible you can factor it and like automate pieces of that. Um, but it is at least an intimidating project. And I think it's plausible that formalizing this kind of defeasible probabilistic reasoning within some heuristic estimator G may make it possible to sort of define what, what it is we mean by an explanation and then automat automate the search for and verification of such explanations. Um, and the rest of this talk, I'm going to be talking about that quest to find this estimator G. Uh, maybe I'll step back here for us again, a couple minutes for questions or a couple seconds. Yeah. Can I just ask briefly? So I think, um, so we had the beautiful talk of Greg Yang at the beginning. And he was describing how these scaling laws arise from reasonably simple considerations of random variables, random matrices, et cetera. And so that would be, would that be an instance of what you're talking about kind of pre-training? You would make some probabilistic argument about the output of a neural network. You know, the output, the output of this, you know, untrained neural network has distribution blah. I think that these kinds of arguments are examples of this general thing of like, you can't prove the theorem, but you can kind of say suggestively why the thing would be true. And so in that sense, I think it's an instance of this pattern. But what we're interested in is really very specifically, given a trained model, you want to explain why the trained model has some property. 
So maybe an illustrative example is like, you have trained GPT-4. When you run GPT-4 in the lab, you find that it doesn't do anything that looks too dangerous. And you're like, say, okay, we want to understand what it is about this model, what it is about the trillions of parameters or whatever, hundreds of billions of parameters in this model that caused it not to do anything that looks dangerous in the lab. And the hope is that if you understand that about this particular model, this particular set of weights, then that will give you some insight into like under what conditions it might do something that looks dangerous or conditions it might do something in, that you know doesn't look dangerous but for a weird reason or on some new input, whether that may break down prior to actually running the model. And should I imagine a kind of billion page proof of a whole lot of estimates of random variables? Yeah, I think you should probably imagine the structure of this argument being kind of similar to that structure of informal interpretability arguments. So saying like, here are some features within your model. Here's some directions that are interesting. And here's some statement about how those features relate. And then those are sort of in some kind of loose correspondence with the concepts they were interested in reasoning about. So for example, if you have a model which is solving SAT, you'd say, well, okay, here's some properties of SAT instances that are interesting. And here's some features in the model. And here's how those line up with each other. And you can kind of walk through your model inductively in the same way that maybe we were in this example of an image model and saying like, if these features have this relationship to this property of the SAT instance, then it makes sense that when you apply the weights, you get new features that would have this other different relationship with the model or with the with the SAT instance. That's like the kind of, I think arguments have to point out features and how they relate to one another and then actually kind of map those relationships on to something about or some way of analyzing the property of interest. But, um, you want to mechanistically find that. So, you know, in Ola, for example, he points at neuron X and says, this is the window neuron or something. And you want yep. to mechanistically generate those interpretations. Yeah, I mean, here, here I'm mostly talking about mechanistically verifying. So saying like, what is like, imagine that like, Chris has done this great job of finding what neurons have these properties. Or maybe let's consider a really simple case of understanding why two neural networks agree with one another. So maybe you have two different neural networks that tend to make similar predictions, um, but trained in very different ways. This is a very simple, simplified case, but I think it, it illustrates what's basically going on. So two neural nets trained to make predictions that make very similar predictions. I want to say, like, suppose that Chris has done a great job and has figured out what's going on. He's like, here's the features in model one, and here's like the very similar features in model two. And you can kind of go through the models inductively and see why they agree about what's a window and therefore they agree about what's a car. I want to just talk about what are the rules of the game? How would Chris like write that up formally into some giant crazy object that can then be checked by a machine? And then I am supposing you can do that. Then I think we can start to talk formally about like, okay, is that actually a possible activity? Like, is there an object that would pass that verification procedure? And perhaps more importantly, like then we can start doing things like automatic search for gradient descent over that space of explanations. So the dream in the very long run is to maintain such explanations in parallel with the training of a model. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very ambitious plan. But here I'm just imagining like, what is the formal thing that even in principle, Chris Law could deliver that explains, for example, why it is that two neural nets agree. Like you might imagine, for example, you have a weak neural network that's just trained to imitate human judgments. And you have a very strong neural network that understands a bunch of stuff humans don't. But still, in simple cases, they agree with one another. And we think that's because the very strong neural network has some concepts inside it that like mirror the human concepts. And those might not be represented linearly. They might be a very abstract relationship. But there's some relationship between those. And we'd love to be able to say, like, what does it mean to like certify that kind of relationship? There's other approaches you could take. Like People most often pursue approaches based on like causal interventions and causal abstractions. And this is kind of in that genre of a, a very different kind of what it would mean to explain such a relationship. So, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the search for this object G. This is most of what our time goes into. We spend some time thinking about empirical results, then some time thinking about how you would use an estimator and sometimes thinking about how you'd find estimates. But by weight, like maybe half of our time or a little bit more goes into just trying to find an estimator G that takes as input arguments and produces an estimate of some quantity X. So you could describe a bunch of different desiderata that we'd like this estimator G to satisfy. So one example is we have this big library of existing informal arguments. We'd like to capture those. In other words, we have a bunch of senses of what like properties coherent estimates should have. We'd like to satisfy those. And then maybe most ambitiously, we'd kind of like it to be universal in the sense that we always think that there exist explanations for neural net behaviors. So I'll talk about those a little bit in this section. Right, so to start with, here's, here's maybe the simplest desideratum, most intuitive desideratum, but not the cleanest to formalize. So there's a lot of domains where we have informal examples of heuristic arguments. So I gave this twin prime prime example. Um, another very simple example is if I just take some complicated hash function, there's a very simple argument that its output distribution is uniform. So probably the collisions to the negative 256 for SHA-256. So we have these very simple informal arguments. 
And in those domains, we don't, we kind of think we know what's going on. So we don't expect there to be big revisions. We don't expect someone to come in and say, oh, here's a consideration you missed about the density of twin primes, because that would be sort of a huge development in number theory. And similarly, we don't expect someone to say, like, here's some structure in SHA-256 you missed. So that'd be a huge deal in cryptography. So in any domain like this, we think it should be possible to take the informal argument pi, turn it into a formal version, pi star. So if you hand this argument to your heuristic estimator G, it gets the anticipated value. So it gets the value like 1.32, whatever, for the twin prime density, two to the negative 256 for the probability of a shock collision. Basically saying that just as you might want a proof verifier to sort of accept a bunch of informal proofs, there should be some formalization of an informal proof that your proof verifier accepts. In cases where we have an informal heuristic argument, there should be some formalization of that informal argument that our heuristic estimator accepts. Lang is actually quite an ambitious property. Right? So this basically means our heuristic estimator needs to both accept formalizations of informally valid arguments, but also that you can't confuse it by giving some other argument that moves it away from the, the anticipated estimate. This is kind of like requires it to really get what's going on in these domains where we have informal examples. I think my perspective as a theoretical computer scientist is even if you set aside the application to neural networks, it would be very interesting to find an object like this. It'd be very interesting to sort of unify all of these informal examples. But if it was possible to find, I think, yeah, if it was possible to find such a G, I think it would be it would be a nice step forward or a very interesting theoretical CS project. So this is our sort of first desideratum. I mean, we do have a pretty large library. I think I have like, maybe we have a hundred examples or so where we know what the answer should be and we have an informal heuristic argument um, and so it, that is quite demanding. I think you could kind of overfit those, but this is almost like you could just imagine running this contest. Right? So the contest is someone submits to us a program G. We then publish the list of 100 informal arguments. They have to present formalizations of each of those informal arguments. And then um, someone else tries to confuse their estimator. And you can just evaluate this game. You can play this game, really, even if we can't formalize it exactly, because it depends on the set of informal arguments. I guess that's one line of what we're looking for. Um, and that's one way of thinking, like, how will we know if we succeeded or what are we trying to do? Um, another, we can also, instead of just thinking about these like very open-ended domains, think of very simple domains where we have a better sense of what's supposed to happen. So a domain we often think about is the permanent. The permanent of a matrix is kind of like the determinant, but without the signs. You take a sum over all permutations of the product of the corresponding elements of your matrix. Um, it's very hard to compute the permanent, right? It's sort of sharp P hard even to approximate or even to compute the sign. But there are a lot of informal arguments that are pretty good for getting you like a rough sense. I mean, they don't explain much of the variation, but I think they give a reasonable rough sense of what the permanent might be like. Um, so for example, if I know the average value in each row, the permanent is a sum of n factorial terms, each of which is the product of one element from each row. So if I multiply together the average values in the rows and multiply that by n factorial, that gives me like a reasonable estimate for the permanent, basically justified by a very similar assumption that things are uncorrelated. Right? I care about the expectation of a product of n variables. I'm just assuming that those variables are independent from one another. I get this estimate. Um, similarly, if I know the column averages, I can produce another estimate. Uh, if I compute particular terms in the sum, and then assume that the rest of the terms are zero. I think it's actually a pretty reasonable estimate, or maybe if I combine it with one of these other two. A slightly more tricky estimate is that if I have a factorization of A, then that tells me that the permanent is non-negative. Um, I won't go through the proof, but just like if you have a PSD matrix, it turns out the permanent is always non-negative. It can be written as a sum of squares using this factorization. So these are a bunch of examples of informal heuristic arguments. And we would like to have a heuristic estimator, which like we think all of these ought to be valid. If you have an estimator general enough to be able to explain things about neural networks, it should be able to definitely capture these kinds of like very simple arguments about this quantity. So now we could say, what are the properties if we're going to try and define an estimator that captures these arguments? Like, what are the co like coherence properties that we want that estimator to satisfy? Like, how do we tell if that estimator is actually like a reasonable operationalization? of a, a reasonable guess for the permanent in light of some arguments. So I'm going to talk about the kinds of properties we expect the heuristic estimator to satisfy, or that we're trying to get a heuristic estimator to satisfy. So an example of a property is if I ask, what's your estimate for a sum? Right? If I say I'm interested in the sum of the following million terms, what's your best guess for that sum? It should be the same as if I ask you for each term one at a time, what's your estimate for this term, what's your estimate for that term, and so on, and then add those all up. This sort of linearity property is obviously satisfied by 
expectations. We'd like it to also be satisfied by this thing, which we think of as behaving as if it was. What's your expected value, your subjective expected value for a quantity? This property looks kind of innocuous, but it's actually just an incredibly strong property to satisfy for sort of any, yeah, it's an incredibly strong property. Basically because we want this to apply not only to small sums, but even to exponentially large sums. Another property is that like, if we have a proof of the value of sum of X, if we can say that X is non-negative, then it ought to be the case that no matter what else you tell me, my estimate for X should be non-negative. Right? It should never be in a position where someone can prove to me that a quantity is non-negative, but my estimate is negative too. Um, another example of a property is if you ask me like, hey, I'm gonna show you some arguments, pi two, what do you think you're going to believe about the value of X after I show you pi two? That should be the same as just asking you like, what is your value of X? It shouldn't be possible for your beliefs to change in a predictable direction if someone shows you a new argument. You could think of all of these properties as just properties that are true of expectations. Like if I had a, like the real a real expectation operator would satisfy these properties. And I want the heuristic estimator to behave as if it was an expectation operator. Right? It should just be like, what's my expectation over my uncertainty in my head? And we want like a reasonable system of argument and estimates that behaves like, how do you think about uncertain quantities? Um, and that should as be as if you were like being a Bayesian and averaging over different possible worlds in your head. That's where we get these kinds of coherence properties. Sorry, Paul, I'm unfamiliar with your little um, if pi some symbol. Blah, oh, sorry, that's just, is, that. um, uh, is, is a proof that. If pi is the proof that, that x is greater than or equal to c, then if you give it to your heuristic estimator, it should estimate greater than or equal to c. And Anna also asked something in the chat. Why yeah. not use the expectation as the heuristic estimator? Yeah, so the, the tricky part is like, if you imagine a deterministic quantity, often we're interested in the deterministic quantity, like what's the accuracy of this neural network? But in some sense, the expectation operator would just be saying, we'll just compute the, the accuracy of the neural network. But the, the challenge of the game comes from like, often we can't compute this quantity exactly. Right, so I think that if you could, if G was just like actually compute this quantity exactly, that would be perfect. And that's kind of the analog of like the actual expectation. And then the question becomes, if you can't compute things exactly, how are we uncertain about them in a way that can be updated based on arguments, right? The twin prime conjecture, it's either true or false. The twin primes just have some density, but I don't know what it is. And I would like my beliefs about it to sort of behave as if they were reasonable. You know, there was a distribution of worlds out there and everything was like a coherent probability distribution over things that could happen. Yeah, so this is maybe the, the upshot of this is like, we had one problem, which was you should formalize this informal heuristic argument. We have another problem, which is you should produce estimates, even in simple cases like permanence, that satisfy just these reasonable coherence properties. Both of these are some distance removed from like, you have a neural network and you want to understand why it has some behavior. And the point was just we move from this like very messy case of analyzing GPT-4 to sort of the simplest cases where we can talk about how these dynamics should work, or we understand very well how proofs work, but we still in these cases have a lot to learn, I think, about how these kinds of heuristic estimates work. And this is the, the focus of our research. So some of our time we spend on actual neural nets, a lot of our time we spend on these like simpler problems, like the permanent. So the basic challenge to satisfying these properties, right, to making coherent estimates given arguments, I think is very similar to the same challenge that arises in the context of neural networks. So the an issue is that we often have multiple different arguments about a quantity or proofs. It's very obvious how you combine them, right? If you have two different proofs, they're just never going to disagree. So you just listen to the one that speaks to the topic. Um, but it's very unclear when you make heuristic arguments how you combine different considerations about the same quantity. Right? Someone can say, here's the reason this quantity is big. Here's the reason this quantity is small. How do you aggregate that? So in this example of permanent, I mentioned that like if I tell you the product of the row averages, that gives you an estimate for the permanent, namely multiply that product by n factorial. So we think that a good heuristic argument ought to have this kind of property. If I just tell you that the product of the row estimates is 187, I ask you what's the permanent, you should output 187 times n factorial. Similarly for column estimates, but then you can ask like, well, what am I supposed to believe if the product of the row estimates is 187 and the product of the column estimates is negative 384 or something, just some random values. Like how do I merge these two kinds of arguments? It was obvious what my answer was supposed to be given one or the other, but how do I reconcile conflicting estimates? In this case, the answer is just like, so I, I maybe haven't explained why, but if you want to satisfy the kinds of properties we've written down or that are natural, you end up with an estimate like 187 minus 384 times n factorial. So it's like not such a hard, this is not such a hard example of a merge. But these games become like much more complicated, right? I can just start adding in more arguments. And sometimes we know what the answer is and how to satisfy properties. So again, in this case, you're like, well, use the use that value for the one permutation you know, then use the default value for everything else. 
But at some point, these get more complicated. You have more arguments and you don't have like a principled way of combining them. We're just kind of playing this game by eyeball. We're like, well, I kind of can see what the answer should be in this case. And I kind of can see what the answer should be in that case. But at some point, I am unable, like when we try and write down something formal, it's unable to combine them all in a way that satisfies the kind of properties that we want. So in this case, where you're merging all of these arguments together, you have this sort of interesting situation where the estimate should be non-negative, right? You have a factorization of your matrix. So you sort of know what's going to happen. You know that the answer should end up being negative, but you can't. So like, if you get a negative estimate out of these other this other methodology, like it's unclear, you can't just truncate that to zero. Like that's not the right way of aggregating all this information together. If you just truncate, like if you did some other estimate, say I think the permanent's negative 30 or whatever, in this case, you know, negative 300, 160 times n factorial. I just truncate that up to zero. That's a very unreasonable estimate for the permanent, which will violate these properties like iterate expectations um, or linearity. So I don't think the slide should make that much sense, like the exact numbers and formulas. It's maybe it's just, just a lot of random garbage. The point is that you, we face these questions. Sometimes it's obvious how to perform these merges. Sometimes it becomes challenging, or it's very hard to merge them in a way that actually satisfies the properties we're looking for. And a lot of what we're grappling with is sort of, okay, now this is a situation you're in constantly. Right? Once you're making these defeasible arguments, there's just a whole incredible list of considerations. And the thing that makes it harder than writing down like a proof verifier is that you need to actually come up with some reasonable way of merging these. You need to have general principles for how you merge different kinds of agreements. Okay, so this is just basically describing the kinds of research goals we have as we're searching for this estimator G. In the last section, I'm going to talk about that third desideratum, this like universality property. Can because... I just ask a question about your previous slide again? Definitely. Yeah, I'd um, like to pause for questions. So. I'm just thinking, you keep adding conditions here. and what happens if the conditions you add are actually um, contradictory? So if they they literally doesn't exist a matrix that satisfies all these things, then your yeah. thing should break down or throw an error or something. Yeah. So the the kind of thing we expect to happen is like if you can see that they're inconsistent. So for example, if you if you can detect, if you can look at that list of conditions and you can prove or you can decide that they're inconsistent, then I think the behavior of this estimator basically is undefined. Like there's sort of no constraints on it really at that point. For the kinds of estimators we've written down, they maybe will often just produce like infinities, basically in the same way that conditioning on a probability zero event does. That said, it's very often going to be the case that you could condition on inconsistent things, but you can't tell they're inconsistent. And in those cases, we will just spit out reason. We'll just keep chugging. We'll be like, well, if all that happened, then this would happen. Like most of the time when things are inconsistent, you can't tell. So I guess I don't know if that answers the question, but like roughly when you condition on something that you can tell has like probability zero, then like things can go really crazy. You can often condition on impossible things though, as long as you can't tell they're impossible. Thanks. Also, uh, Michael asked the question in the chat. Should this measure just apply to the final train network, like a snapshot, or do you think this measure should be dynamic and care about the entire history of training data, et cetera? So I'd say what we're interested in ultimately is the behavior of the final trained model that is we are mostly trying to be able to answer questions like, for this trained model, is it possible that on a new data distribution, it will have some new property X? Or like on a new input, is it proper possible that it will exhibit some new property? And so for that purpose, we want to just understand the behavior of the final model that were delivered. And so the way that we expect this to engage with training is just we expect to build up this explanation kind of dynamically over the course of training. So we don't expect someone's just going to hand us a neural network and then we're going to explain how it works. I think that looks like it's a computationally intractable problem in general. The thing that looks like it's possible is to say, here's what a good explanation is. Here's the behavior we're explaining. And we're going to like preserve, and this is, this is very subtle, but like we're going to try and produce, preserve this explanation over the whole course of training. Like at the beginning of training, you have some random model, which doesn't have kind of this interesting property and your explanation is trivial. And then as the model develops this behavior, you sort of build up your explanation in parallel with actually building up the features. And so part of the purpose here of having this whole formalism is that you can do that gradient descent in parallel with the training of the model. But the actual result you end up with at any given point in time is just a description of the behavior of the current snapshot of the model. So we're kind of viewing the whole training history as just like a guide to help us understand the trained result without actually talking about or proving theorems about how you got there or what happened over the course of training. In particular, we're like never proving a theorem or trying to heuristically argue about something about the training process. We're always trying to heuristically argue about properties of a particular model. Yeah, now I'm going to talk about, I mentioned basically two desiderata. One is formalizing informal arguments. Another is sort of merging arguments in a coherent way. And I'm going to talk about a third desideratum that's in some sense the most central one. It's no coincidence principle. So this name I just, or this principle as is, we just took from this Tim Gower's paper from earlier this year. 
um, the informal statement is that if an apparently outrageous coincidence happens in mathematics, then there is a reason for it. So for example, if there were only finitely many twin primes, then from our current vantage point, that looks like an outrageous coincidence. And therefore nature owes us an explanation. Nature is not allowed to just be like, yep, turns out there were no more twin primes. If we found that the twin primes just stopped at some point, the claim is uh, we would be licensed to just keep searching until we understood why it stopped. It couldn't just have been a coincidence. So this is a totally informal statement. I haven't defined outrageous coincidence, I haven't defined reason, but I think I basically believe that this is actually a kind of convincing empirical regularity. So mathematics has at various points found unexplained phenomena that appear to be outrageous coincidences and has quite a good track record of eventually tracking down the explanation. So not always the proof, but quite often a proof and always yeah. something. Like as an example, once upon a time, it was observed that like primes are three mod four more often than they're one mod four. And just for a long time, that's just like some mystery. But then it is the case that you're like, that is kind of outrageously coincidental. Like, why would there be such a bias? And you do eventually get to the bottom of it. Like number theory does eventually say, like, oh, we see why. It all makes sense. We have a proof now of this fact, basically, modulo some heuristic step in the Riemann hypothesis. So independent of the neural net case, I just find this principle incredibly intriguing. I, I didn't start thinking about this until I got here through this interpretability angle. But at this point, I'm like, actually, this would be a very interesting thing to try and formalize whether or not I cared about neural networks. So for the purpose of this talk, if we think about operationalize this principle in terms of a heuristic estimator, I think the formalization ends up being that a statement is an outrageous coincidence if its probability is exponentially small in the length of the statement. Um, so the reason for this odd looking definition, or the reason I'm gonna use, I'm sort of just making an arbitrary definition, but the reason I made it is that if your probabilities were well calibrated, then actually zero outrageous coincidences should ever occur. Right, so, for example, for the twin prime conjecture claim, if you imagine asymptotically large numbers, actually the probability appears to be zero if you run the naive estimate. You're like every time you hit a number, there's a reasonable chance to get a twin prime. And if you just integrate out, you say, well, there's zero probability. There's only finally many of them. Um, and even though there's a lot of statements, no events of probability zero should occur, no matter how many statements I look for. And this is kind of just the quantitative version that makes the probability small enough that that exponential sum converges. So the converse of that claim about calibration is that if something appears to be an outrageous coincidence, it means that we're missing something. Right? We're missing some explanation for why that phenomenon is actually more plausible. Um, and in this context, right, we think that our heuristic estimator G should have the property that for any statement phi, there is an explanation pi that causes G to believe that statement is plausible for any true statement. And if I start with the twin prime conjecture, if I just point out this argument that like, hey, the primes have density one over log n, that means that like the probability of infinitely many twin primes is one. If it turns out there are only finitely many, there has to be some argument pi that explains why that's the case. This is kind of the quantitative operationalization of this principle. And this would be, initially, I'm, again, I'm very interested philosophically, but it's very relevant to the machine learning application, right? So let's imagine going back to our original toy setting, we have some model F sub theta trained to predict G. Suppose it's the case that it obtained perfect accuracy just to make life simple. If you imagine, if you make some kind of independence argument about F sub theta, it ends up looking a lot like a uniformly random function. And then the probability of agreeing with G on every input is going to be like doubly exponentially small. So unless my model is very big, right, big enough to have memorized this exponentially large number of possible input, Points. This will be an outrageous coincidence, according to the definition on the preceding slide. And so if you believe this no coincidence principle, any outrageous coincidence has to have some explanation that gets the probability up from this like doubly exponential initial estimate to something that's just singly exponential. And this is the thing we're looking for. We try and say we want to explain like the reason why we might think that there always exist explanations of complicated neural net behaviors is precisely some principle like this. If there weren't an explanation, then it would never happen by coincidence alone. The probability was just too small. Um, I think I'll probably stop here before trying to get into, so I think unsurprisingly, you can try to take this kind of principle and push it forward to some like complexity theoretic claims that are moving away from math and into complexity theory. I'll probably just leave it here and be happy to talk about sort of the mathematics or like the, the philosophical claim and the connection to neural networks and estimators. Maybe just stepping back though and using the last like minute or two to review where we're at overall. I think, again, I have not given any algorithm for anything in this talk. I have tried to describe like the project of explaining a neural network behavior and offer up this notion of a heuristic estimator G as a way of operationalizing or formalizing what we mean by an explanation. 
I've tried to explain some of the properties or like present some of the properties that we're trying to seek. Right? When we are trying to construct a G, we're looking for something that satisfies these coherence properties and formalizes informal arguments and satisfies this kind of ambitious no coincidence principle. Uh, and I think if we succeeded at that, then we would it would not be the end of this journey on interpretability, but I think it would be a helpful step, right? So it'd be helpful to say like we have a formal notion of what it means to like, explain why a neural network works or explain why a neural network appears to be safe. And it is plausible that you could then find such objects either by doing normal interpretability or gradient descent, and that you could use them to answer questions like understanding when an explanation breaks down or when a model may behave badly off distribution. I think we consider those applications exciting enough that we're willing to spend really a lot of time. It would be, I think it would be very valuable to find an estimate that satisfied these properties. So we've been working on it for like around a year and a half at this point. Um, hopefully we'll have like some more concrete things to share over the coming months. Um, but right now it is, does seem like a very hard problem. We're mostly at the level of stating and understanding what the problem is, assessing whether it's likely to exist. Cool. I've got one remark in chat that mathematicians have been assuming this no coincidence principle implicitly. I think that's basically right. I think mathematicians agree with the no coincidence principle in the abstract, or like when I've pulled them, they think that outrageous coincidences do have co explanations. I think the thing that would be very philosophically striking and that they mostly don't agree with is that there is kind of any formal definition of explanation or reason for which this is true. I think the intuition is like it's true in some informal sense, but any formal system of explanation won't capture explanations for every phenomenon. And so another interesting thing I didn't discuss at all is just like, to what extent is there a Gedelian obstruction or diagonalization obstruction to this kind of estimator explaining everything? There actually isn't one. So I don't know. I think it's a really interesting question, whether the informal principle has any formalization at all. I definitely think I feel mathematicians love proofs too much. I should be more open to just understanding what's true and heuristic estimates about things. But I might be biased. Yeah. I think if you want to do interpretability, if you want mathematicians doing interpretability, they need to broaden their horizons beyond proof, probably. Yeah, I, I actually think as a mathematician, this thinking this way is actually very valuable. I always tell my students that there's there's two reasons we prove something. And the one is to uh, to formally verify that the thing actually is true, because historically we've been burnt, and so we want to be very careful. But the second reason, actually the more important one, is to explain in human terms why something is true. And that's already what a good heuristic argument would give us for a, a tiny fraction of the effort. So, for example, I teach a number theory course. I could I could spend four you know four hours proving the prime number theorem, or I could spend ten minutes giving heuristic. Um, I know which one is a better uh, investment for my students. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I I view the heuristic argument for the prime number theorem as kind of like the reason why it's true. And the proof is like a very sensitive instrument that would pick up if there was any more subtle thing that violated it. So like does it is really important for ruling out the thing that's wrong. But like I think there is a real sense in which the heuristic argument is like the prima facie reason why the prime number theorem, like why is the density log n, I would claim is actually about that argument and not about the facts about analysis. But this is as a non-numbered theorist, totally speculating. Um the rough part is if uh if you give up on human understandable, then it's more complex. Like uh, this question, how much do you love a proof if no human understands it? And I think that is what will become relevant in the neural net case. Because I think we will have these arguments for GPT-4 and we'll be like, it's just a trillion numbers. And it's a, it's a whole another archaeology project for humans to make sense of those trillion numbers. Like, that's tricky. And, and going forward, this is maybe how we'll have to deal with one day GPT-6 giving us a, you know, five terabyte proof of the Riemann hypothesis. And then uh, what do we do with that? So we, yeah. uh, we would like to understand why the Riemann hypothesis is true beyond just, well, now there has to be a super coincidence for you know putting one of these zeros off the critical line. But uh, we want more than that. And so there will be a future where, where computers will be better at proving new theorems than we are. I'm convinced of that. And in that future, we either go extinct or we uh, our job changes to understanding, explaining to other humans why these things that the machines have discovered are true and how we can still make sense of it. It will be a weird situation. I can't see into lecture hall, I think. So I actually don't know if someone is, anyway, I'm happy for someone else to, to guide the flow of conversation. Yeah, I have some questions. The first one is, can you make, um, is, is there too much feedback? Can you hear me? Um, it's not too bad. I can hear you. Yeah. There's definitely an echo. Um, can you maybe go back to uh, Nanda's example where we know sort of the explainability and see how your program would distill that? Yeah, so I think there's like two exercises you can do in the context of this example. 
Um, one is you can literally try and get a proof. And we believe that like a proof would constitute is a special case of a heuristic argument. And so I am very interested in that. Like with no additional theoretical progress on foundations, you can just say, how close is this thing to a proof? And I think the answer is like not that close um, empirically. Uh, the second thing you can do is you can try and say like, well, we don't quite know formally what we mean by a heuristic argument. If we understand, like I was saying, often humans can come up with a reasonable estimate. Like these aren't totally alien. And so you can try and do the version that like feels to a human like this feels like a compelling heuristic argument. And that is still quite a bit more formal than like what Neil has done. I think Neil's saying like, here's some experiments and here's some like evocative illustrations and seeing how things work. And like, a lot, I think it's pretty convincing. I believe he's right about what's happening, um, but it's not that close to like, here's an estimate that gives you an exact probability or like a, that gives you a forecast for how good this model is. Um, I think you can try and formalize them. So this is something ARC is working on in parallel. We're mostly starting with yeah, small models of the kind that like Neil's, Neil analyzed in this, this example. Um, I think we don't really know. I, I would say it seems like it works OK so far. Um, I think the structure, yeah. I think it's too early for me to really say that much. But I am like optimistic that we're going to be able to say, like, yes, we can catch up with mechanistic interpretability or where it's at and say, like, those arguments do get translated. Like, which I, you know, I think. In some sense, it's sad to not be pushing the frontiers, but in some other sense, it's nice to be able to say, like, here's some stuff people have done, like maybe a little bit informally, like here is like a rules of the game or a way of thinking about why these are adequate and like explaining that. Um, I don't know if I have that much to say about what it looks like other than like, um, I think it looks, I expect them to look like reasonably like these arguments, but with like much more attention to like exactly what are the probability distributions of these terms. Like the big thing that's not tracked in these is like, you say this direction represents this thing, but like, that's a really rich quantitative statement of like exactly what is the probability distribution over this thing and exactly how is that coupled to this other probability distribution. And just being really quantitatively careful about that is necessary to get any kind of estimate. And people historically haven't done that much of that in mechanistic interpretability. They've more been like qualitatively, what's this direction mean? And not so much like here's here's how you interpret the exact magnitude. Thanks. And another question is some are Occam's razor coming in, like explainability is sort of related to sort of the, the simplest explanations that you can find. Yeah, I think in some sense, the, the whole question is like, what is the version? Maybe if you ask like, what's the motivation for this whole project? We have a bunch of, we want people to understand what's up with the neural network. We're like, we think if we understood a neural network, we could do all of these additional tasks. And there is some very Occam's razor-ish intuition about what does it mean to understand a neural network, like finding the simplest explanation for some fact about the neural network or for the neural network's behavior or something. But it's very shockingly hard to operationalize like what we mean by that. Like a view you could have is like, it's compressing the neural network, but like actually that's not quite right. Like often neural networks just aren't that compressible and the explanation doesn't actually compress it. Or it could be like, it's a fast program for making some kind of prediction about the neural network. But often those programs actually aren't any faster than just running the neural network itself. And so I think like, what we've ended up saying is like this, this perspective, it is the simplest like argument that you can give to the heuristic estimator. But like the thing that it has is not like it agrees with some input output functionality or it allows you to predict something or it allows you to compress the model or anything like that. The thing it does is just, it is the simplest thing you can hand to this estimator G that will allow it to see what the answer is. And so in some sense, it's just like, we are into the simplest explanation. And then the question is just like, what is an explanation? Is it about prediction or is it about compression or is it about counterfactuals? And this is just like another possible answer to that question that we think is like, it's very understandable. People haven't thought about it because like we have now embarked for 18 months on this like insane project to search for this crazy object that you no know, has any idea what it like, should look like. But on the other hand, like I do think that other operationalizations are not like, I think for every other operationalization that has been offered, it's very easy to be like, okay, here's a case that's not really right. That's not like literally what I meant. I think that's just been like a never ending cycle. And I, I do think probably we're either going to use the informal version or it's going to be some kind of elaborate formal project to understand like what is really meant. Thank you. Maybe briefly. Um, so my understanding is that your your search for this G is uh, predominantly motivated by safety concerns. But I was wondering if um, there could also be some consequences for interpretability or if you anticipate consequences for interpretability. Yeah, I, mean, I think our goals here are extremely aligned with the goals of interpretability researchers. And so I think that like if successful, it would be very directly, like interpretability people want a bunch of different things out of their interpretations. And I think if successful, we will help them with some of those goals and not with others. So like examples of goals we might help them. I think like 
the first thing we would be doing is providing like, I think a standard of success. Like we'd say, here's a formal notion of what it means to have an adequate explanation. And my guess is that should match up roughly with what people do in interpretability. Like the arguments people give, especially in mechanistic interpretability. Yeah, basically just, I think it's most relevant by far for mechanistic interpretability. I think the arguments people give should fit in the framework we're developing. And if it doesn't, then that's a sign that like, well, either they've made a mistake or we've made a mistake. And I think that is relevant to the field. I think just having a sense of like, here are the rules of the game and here's what it means to like really nail a two layer model. Here's what it means to like really explain it. And then now we can like start pushing that forward. I think would be valuable. I think that field does suffer a little bit from not understanding exactly what are the rules of the game. And similarly, like I think it is a possible approach to automation. I think the approach to automation people have most thought about interpretability is like, can you train systems to do the kind of work that human would do and then just scale that up? And this is kind of taking a different route. We say, like, well, can we just understand what it is the human was trying to do and not actually even have a human in the loop at all, just strip out the human and say, can we automatically find an object that satisfies this formal criterion? So I think in some sense, it should be helpful to reduce the kinds of things people look at. I think the big divergence is like often human understanding is an engine itself in interpretability. So sometimes people want to do interpretability in order to answer some question about a model, like to ask like, hey, what's the probability on some new input the model will do a surprising thing? And for that, I think these formal objects could be quite helpful. Right? You can ask, you can say, hey, is there an input where the model has property P? No human has to understand in order to use your interpretability to answer a question like that. That was just a question. You want to see the structure of the model just to make predictions about its behavior. And so there, I think it's some of those questions are very reasonable and that will be basically an alternative to or like a way a way to help interpretability researchers do that thing. And then there are other questions where people just wanted to understand because they don't even know what they're looking for. They want to see what the model is doing and just sit with it and like decide whether they're happy with that. And for that, I think we're not going to be as helpful. I think in that sense, like I mean, maybe we're helpful as like a stage of a pipeline where you like produce an explanation of this form, but then you would have the same problem you have when you look at like a crazy proof. Like you have your billion page proof and you're like, well, now it's just an incredible project for humans. Like we now have to do interpretability on this output. Like we have to make sense of this thing that we found. And I think there's no particular reason that that would be, that's sort of, I'm not even sure if that's easier than the original project to just explain the network. I mean, I hope it would be, but it, I think it's just not clear we help at all with that task. The other thing, like this might be a stupid question, but I was wondering about it. So, you know, there's, there's situations in computer science where we would desperately like to know that the output of very complicated program is never one because one is, I don't know, launching a nuclear weapon or something like that. Yeah. And then you could imagine that such situations also arise in neural networks. And then you can imagine that ARC is successful and provides this G and G is a very accurate estimator of this neural network, but it still might not be possible to decide whether G ever takes the value one. Yeah, so I think you should be able to ask, I hope would be if you like, what we would do? is we would say like, here's a bunch of inputs. C never took the value one on any of those inputs. What we're going to try and do is produce an explanation for why. So we're gonna try and say like, okay, here's the fact we know the probability of C outputting one is at most one in a million. Let's try and find an explanation for why. And then once you have that explanation in hand, you can ask like, okay, how tight can we make that bound? So was it like coming close or like if you actually look at the argument for why it's not happening, you can then ask like how confident, how much confidence does this argument give us? And like, there's maybe two dimensions of confidence. You could think of them as like within model uncertainty and outside of model uncertainty. And like the within model uncertainty, you're like within model risk can get much lower than one over a million. But you could say like, actually like, look, the reason it never does it is because this number is always really small or because these features always have this in this relationship to one another. Like you can tell a story like this that can give you the confidence much higher. Maybe the most salient way confidence compares like the only way this would fail is if like these five things all went wrong and these five things each have probability like one in a million so it's actually one in a million to the fifth power or something like that so you can have like you can use this kind of technique or this kind of g and provide significant additional within model certainty i think it doesn't so a proof would also provide like robustness to out of model uncertainty like there can't be any fact about the neural network you've overlooked this g is not providing that kind of assurance so it can help you like sometimes get to much lower error probabilities it can't help you. Like if someone has put a backdoor in your model, the kind of method we're describing won't be able to notice that backdoor until you actually encounter an input that involves the backdoor. So you might be able to flag a backdoor as like, oh, something weird is happening. Our argument didn't talk about. But you won't be able to tell in advance, like, oh, there's a backdoor in the model. Um, whereas a proof would have to rule out the existence of a backdoor. And this is related to why proofs are just very, very hard to find. I think that makes this technique like potentially very helpful for cases where, like a model is deliberately doing something badly, where like the model has learned a function where like you know, it's a mind and it's thinking about what's happening. And it's like, okay, I'm going to wait until I'm confident I'm not being watched and then I'm going to kill everyone or whatever. I think in cases like that, you should have significant within model risk. 
like you should look at how it's thinking be like oh the only reason it's not doing something bad is it has such and such belief about the situation or like you're not saying this this is what's happening in fact in this proof you don't understand like there's some kinds of error where you would be able to detect it in this way and i think those are very important kinds of error but there's others where you wouldn't i think this is the same for interpretability like i think normal interpretability would also have essentially no chance of detecting a carefully placed backdoor until it saw a backdoor input when it would be able to flag that something is wrong um, and i think again that's good for some problems bad for other problems i think for like these loss of control problems or alignment problems it's particularly appropriate i forgot actually there was a question from anna in the in the chat from a while ago. Yes, do, do you think automated reasoning AI could come up with a reasoning for this general argument? Yeah, so I guess uh, my understanding here, and should correct me if I'm wrong, is the question is like, could AI systems find, like if we have these norms of reasoning, like these norms of heuristic reasoning, and we want to know about some property of our neural network, could an AI system like find that heuristic argument? Like, could it figure out, I'm like, why is my neural network safe? And my AI is like, oh, here's an argument. Do the same kind of thing interpretability researcher might do. Is that like a fair description of the question? I'll assume yes. So I think they're like, are like, I would say plan A is like this gradient descent thing. I think like gradient descent is in some sense like a better mesh to the nature of the problem. If you're like, who is able to understand GPT-4? I'm not actually sure that like GPT-4 can understand GPT-4. The main thing I know, the only system I know that's capable of like working with the weights of GPT-4 in a reasonable way is basically gradient descent over the weights. So I'd say like plan A is to rely on gradient descent to find this kind of argument. But I do think like it is not crazy at all for AI systems to try and do it as well. So like in any case, like a human would try and do interpretability. I think you could try and say like, hey, I'm not sure GPT-4 can understand GPT-4. Maybe it has a chance. Enough copies of GPT-4 working together can like poke and prod at the model and like understand what's going on. And then I do think that's like reasonably important to explore and reasonably like it is good to have an understanding of what we're doing so that it can help humans do it so that we can train AI systems to do it so we can get gradient descent to do it. And I have no idea which of those are promising. I think all of them are promising enough that they combine together in my head to be like, man, it would be great if we could say what we were doing precisely in such a way that we can optimize it like this. Sorry, Paul, can I just ask a, ask a question about scalability of the GE? Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I don't understand the issues you've been raising and I'm pretty sure I didn't understand Greg Yang's talk. But if I did, um, it, it, it involves scaling to larger um, networks and, and having some um, constraints on the uh, initializing the weights. And so I'm just wondering if, is there like a robust scaling path where if you could say something about a G for, for a toy network, you could say something about the, the way you're allowed to scale it and, and maintain certain, uh, a kind of G that works on a bigger network. Yeah, so I think that our hope is to find a G which is sort of like structurally the right answer in the same way like a proof verifier is the right answer, like the norms of reasoning that are basically as an algorithm, it's a reasonable algorithm. I think if you're in that regime, then you can kind of test generalization a little bit. And if you generalize a little bit, you have like a pretty good shot. So like what I expect we're going to do is we're going to work with tiny models as we are now until we really believe in things. So work with like models with 10 million parameters until we like really nail things. We'll then have our algorithm, which we think is like the right algorithm. And then the next test is like, well, now you try and run it on models with a billion parameters. And like, you hope that the thing that worked with 10 million parameters, like it wasn't trained. It's not like asking a neural net to generalize. It was just an algorithm you wrote down. And so you hope that the algorithm you wrote down, and you wrote down for 10 million parameters, generalizes smoothly. You like hope you've got the right algorithm. And so then you can test on like, does that thing just work on models with a billion parameters? And if so, then you hope like, okay, now things actually look pretty good. Like there's a reasonable chance this thing was working for the right reasons and it's going to continue working. So I guess we sort of hope that if you find the right algorithm, you have like very nice scaling or there is an algorithm that works across all scales. And so even like 100 million parameters is enough to force you to find that right algorithm. I think, again, it's the case for many kinds of problems in computer science. It's often not the case in ML. Um, although I think this is related to Greg's talk in the sense that it's like, yeah, you want to find, it is the case, do the sort of thing it's doing. Once it works for a reasonable range of scales, you do actually have a reasonable bet that's going to keep working out to larger scales. So it's that kind of connection. I don't think it's another like more direct connection. That is, we hope G itself has just like very nice sort of algorithmically obvious scaling properties. Like G should run in linear time. We pretty much need G to run in linear time. We can certify that even in like very small cases and often it'd probably be obvious from the structure. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Thanks enormously, Paul. This was fascinating. Thank you. So let's thank oh. Paul again and have a good afternoon, Paul, and morning, everyone else. <laughs>